Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I know we're having people from different continents and all over the world. So I will say welcome. I will say caribou. I will say bienvenue, benvenido, bienvenue. Uh, Tian Yen, you're going to have to teach me that in uh, Vietnamese. Um, it's a pleasure. Yeah. To, yes. It's a pleasure to, to see everyone and to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, you are here. This is the Girl Child Long Walk Project. We are a project of Imago Dei Fund. And our focus is on gender equality, community-led development, and faith. That very important piece of our lives. Um, I am, my name is Marie Rose, Romain Murphy, and I'm a senior project consultant, a member of the team of the Girl Child Long Walk Project. We have been conducting and facilitating these courageous conversations and co-creating them with the panelists. Uh, we are basically trying to make sure that we discuss and we discuss and we address issues that are usually not discussed and issues that should be discussed. Today, we are talking about youth, faith, and gender equality, a very important topic. In terms of um, our conversation right now, please keep yourself on mute. Um, please feel free. We sort of like love to hear about people, your comments, your questions. We will have a bit of time at the end to have some questions and some interactions, hopefully. And in terms of the agenda right now, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna have Emily Jones, the co-founder, Nielsen Jones, um, lead us to a moment of reflection. We will show the girl child video, which is about patriarchy. And afterward, we'll dive in into this great conversation. We have wonderful people, two young fantastic panelists, and we have a guest speaker, Reverend Patrick, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Patrick Musembi, that I we know as all Patrick, is <laughs> a girl child long walk fellow, and um, we will set the stage. So right now, without further ado, Emily, could you please lead us into a moment of reflection? Sure, and it will be a moment um, only because we have a large topic and amazing speakers. Um, I invite you now to close your eyes and just get centered where you're sitting. Breathe in a few deep nourishing breaths. And I invite you to hold a girl child you know and love in your heart. Feel her aspirations. I invite you now to hold your own life journey in your heart. You are right where you are meant to be learning and growing. And that's what this meeting is all about. Girl child long walk. It is way too long of a walk. And young people, you are our future. With that, I'll say amen. And we'll and hold that girl child you know and love as we watch this video. Thank you, Emily. Kazi, could you please start? Could you hear me? Kazi, where is she? Don't tell me we lost her. That would be bad. Hold on a minute. 
um, if there's a delay, I'll just describe the video um, and we can start. So we created this video because um, it's a long ancient story um, that we need to tell to explain why the world is the way this, the way it is, the why the reason girls are born into a world that is so exploitative and devaluing of their humanity. And it's very hard to tell the long ancient story over and over again. There are tomes written about it. Um, uh, Reverend, Reverend Dominic Masolo and I wrote um, a book, an ebook called The Girl Child and Her Long Walk to Freedom. And it's a deep dive. So this video tells that story in animated terms um, in a very quick, accessible way. Um, so Tori, are you able to? I think I need to share my screen as the host and play it. So let me try that. Okay. Um. <laughs> you remember who you were before the world told you who you should be. Deep down, I've always believed in myself and known I'm just as good as anyone else. But lately, I notice that the world treats me differently because I'm a girl. From sunrise to sunset, my sisters and I do chores at home while my brothers get to do whatever they want. And I see my mother carry the full burden of tending to our family. In church, they don't like when I ask questions, so I've learned to sit quietly. In the street, I see girls who walk in fear as mothers warn their daughters not to give men the wrong idea. Everywhere I look, the world tells me I'm inferior, but this does not feel true. What's going on here? Girl child, you are right to question. Who? Do I know you? I am your mother's mother and her mother's mother. I am the mother of all. Then you must know why the world treats us this way. Please tell me, how did this come to be? Well, it is complicated and there are many overlapping theories. But we do know that these traditions were man-made long, long ago. It was not always like this. In the beginning, men and women walked side by side together, valued equally as hunters and gatherers. Eventually, we began to settle down. And around this time, we elevated the idea of property and the need to own land and control the workforce. Men became protective of what was theirs, which led to fighting. Sexual violence against women became a weapon of war. Conquerors enslaved women as concubines. Men felt entitled to own and take on many wives, even in times of peace. As their wealth grew, so did the desire to give males an inheritance. Girls came to be seen as property, valued primarily for their sexual purity and ability to have children. They were exchanged between families for price. Many girls were subjected to traditions aimed at preserving their purity and family honor. Many are still practiced today. It is this domination that gave birth to all forms of slavery and how women became the world's first slaves. It is how patriarchy and the ethic of male honor became the norm. Patriarchy was woven into our civilizations. Our laws, economies, philosophies, sciences, and especially our religions. It is everywhere, and it is invisible. It's no accident that we replaced ancient images of God as both male and female with images of God as a man. But haven't we made progress since those times? In some ways, yes. But in many ways, we're still moving in the wrong direction. But what can I do when patriarchy is everywhere? I can't turn my back on my family or on my faith. There is a spiritual path to liberation in the Bible and other religious traditions, but we must be brave and question what isn't working. Women and men, girls and boys, even the earth itself are suffering under the domination of patriarchy. To heal our land, we must bravely untangle our traditions from this oldest depression. What was made by our hand can also be unmade. We must keep walking the Exodus path from slavery to the freedom of the promised land. 
Imagine if we could re-know the beautiful world that was meant for all God's children. A world where girls can grow up feeling safe and equally valued? A world where both boys and girls grow up to be all they were meant to be. Girl child, your curiosity has set you on a path many others have walked before you. Because of their work, we know the way forward, but there's a lot more to do and more truths to discover. Are you ready to take this journey with me? Thank you, Tari. And now, what I would like to do is to say a few words and just give you a sense about statistics very quickly, as far as young people. Africa is one of the, is actually the youngest continent with 60% of its population below the age of 25. You also have a large and growing uh, population of Christians. You have 57% of the population being Christian. Um, then you have 27% being Muslim, talking about another faith. You've had a shrinking number of people sort of saying and declaring themselves to be embracing the African animist religion. But again, you know, very often people do uh, embrace a couple of religions. Across the world, you have what we're talking about, sort of like Africa, it's about six, 650 million people. They are the next generation. They are the people who are going to shape our world. This is why this conversation is important. This is why it's important to make sure we engage youth and we leverage their leadership. Now, talking about leadership, let me very quickly introduce you to our panelists. We have first um, a guest speaker, Reverend Dr. Musambi, who is the Dean of the School of Arts and Science at Daystar University, and who is, um, a Girl Shall Long Walk Fellow, and also leading a project that is uh, having an amazing impact on gender equality in Kenya. Um, and then uh, let me introduce very quickly, and it's not a surprise that, you know, they are related. Uh, we have Zawadi Musambi, who's a secondary school student and women rights advocate, also based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Uh, then you have Brian Lepish, last but not least, who is an international relations student at Daystar University and also a gender equality um, advocate. So we are excited to have them today and before, uh, let me see, with no further ado, um, Reverend Patrick uh, Musembi. Yeah. All right, so thank you, Emily, uh, um, Mary Hoss. I, I'm so happy and excited to be part of this meeting this afternoon for those of us in East Africa. And uh, I come to you from our Daystar campus, the main campus, which is uh, uh, some 45 kilometers, about 30 miles from Nairobi. Uh, I've been working there today. And just, just to give to us some statistics about an interest that was created in me by the long, uh, Gaucha long walk to freedom. And when I became a fellow, 
Hi. Am I audible to all of us? Yes. Thank you. I developed some great interest in this work and I just wanted to know what is happening around me and what about young people and what are they saying? So in 2022, last year, I decided to do a quick sample of my students, just a simple survey that uh, I conducted amongst the male students at Daystar. And what is before you, these are the results of that uh, survey that I conducted uh, for students who are in their third year and fourth year of their study. These are students of the ages between 21, 22, and 23. So these are the young people in our country and, and, and essentially in the continent as we have had the statistics earlier. So I just wanted to know uh, some things around gender equality and concerns about the girl child. And I thought to ask them whether they were aware, the boys, whether they were aware of the privileges they enjoy by being boys and men in their communities as a result of the value that is placed on them by culture. Interestingly, out of a total of 74 students who participated in this uh, survey, 78%, more than half, said that they were aware of the privileges that they enjoy by being boys and being men in their own communities. They are aware compared to only 22 who said they were not aware. And it will be interesting to probe further to find out why did they say that they were not aware of the privileges that they enjoy. Is it that they have just taken it as, um, as a right and so they do not want to speak about it? And secondly, I sought to know if they were aware of the negative effects of male dominance on women and girls in their own community. And again, a total of 91% said that they were aware of the negative effects of male dominance on women and girls in their own community. Interestingly, just compared with a negligible 9%, seven students who said they were not aware. And again, I sought to ask from them whether their upbringing and family preparation or socialization uh, gave them knowledge and, and to acknowledge and respect gender equality in their upbringing. And interestingly, again, enough, 82% said that their upbringing and their families prepared them to acknowledge gender, gender equality. This is interesting. If we look at the statistics, when we know what is happening uh, here, then the next I sought to ask from them whether, are we good? Yeah. Whether they, they were aware of any programs or initiatives involving boys and men in their communities. Um, and, and they said, 65% said they were not aware, implying that we do not have many programs that are talking about gender equality, boy-child relationships and equality within the community. It's not a common thing on our part of the world this way because that is compared with only 35% who say they were aware. And when I sought to ask them whether they had attended any form of training on gender equality uh, in the last one to three years, Again, a total of 62% said they had not attended any training talking about gender equality in the last three years, implying again, such programs are not common and are not available for the young men in our localities. And finally, I sought to know from them whether they were willing to participate in a gender equality program, particularly involving men and, and, and boys, and again, here, it was a surprise because 85% said that they were willing to participate in such a program. But I was interested in the 11% who said, I mean, 15%, uh, about 11 students out of the 74, who said they were not interested in participating in that. Is, is it because they have taken it um, 
as 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 a non issue it's it's not anything they need to hear about why are they not interested i would have loved to do to know more and so as i move to the next stage of my survey i will seek to answer some of the questions that were not there why are they not willing to participate in a program about there and what programs are available in their vicinity uh, how do they look like? I will seek to know that. So in general, friends, I just want to say that in terms of awareness, our young people are aware that uh, they have they privileges that are enjoyed by boys and men. They are aware that there are negative effects of male dominance in our community. But that is not what is reflected in reality and in statistics when we ask other questions. And I will give you a quick example as I, as I move. This was done by Afrobarometer. Afrobarometer is a research agency that conducts uh, nationwide surveys for countries. And we have statistics for East Africa, the entire three countries, uh, the, the, the main ones, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. It will be of interest to know what they were looking for. They sought to find out whether domestic violence is private affair or a legal matter that needs to be adjudicated through uh, legal agencies. And they asked people this question, which of the following statements is closest to your view? Listen to statement number one, domestic violence is a private matter that needs to be handled and resolved within the family. Look at the statistics, scary. We have a long way to go. 54% of Kenyans said strongly agreed that uh, domestic violence is a private matter that just needs to be handled within the family confines and does not need to go out. That is a scaring, friends. That's quite yeah. scary. Any Kenyan you move around in the, in the country and ask them, that's their position, compared to 15% who agreed, actually, more than half of the population agreed that uh, domestic violence private matter. Look at that compared to whether domestic violence is a criminal matter. The second statement, domestic violence. Um, everyone go on mute I, who's not I, talking. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, can everyone go on mute? Everyone on mute? Or... I'm sorry. All right. Do I continue? I, I think I think your your statistics, your survey, your findings or uh, illustrating uh, very vividly the fact that the status quo, the way things are right now, is not good news. Absolutely, that's my message, thank you. And, that is and confirming message. and conforming, and especially I think as we know, it's gotten worse during the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and it's, Fascinating to find out that you have a lot of young people not only being aware, a lot of young men, that they are privileged, but not interested in doing anything about it. So, I mean, right now, I thank you very much, um, Patrick. And right now, you know, I would like to turn to Zawadi. Um, Zawadi, there just doesn't seem to be an interest in changing the status quo. So what do you think is at the, at the root of gender inequality? Is fate part of it? What's going on with young people? I mean, we need to know, given <laughs> given the size of, of, of your population, you know? So please. Um, thank you very much, Mary Rose, for introducing me. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zawadi Musembi, as has been said. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And yes, so today's question is, what do young people think about faith and gender? I think this is a very important question that needs to be asked, especially as seen with the statistics that my father has just shared right now. I'll admit, when I was first tasked with this question, I really had to dig deep. Was there really a connection between faith and patriarchy? It seemed to me I only knew the ways in which faith and religion acted as the antagonist in the story of women's oppression. But as a hero, I was drawing blank. For my piece of this conversation, I'd like to retrace the steps I took when I was preparing for this conversation. First, we'll be illustrating the connection between faith 
in patriarchy, just as we had seen in the girl child video. And second, we'll be charting a faith related path to gender equality. But first, before we begin, I'd like to start us off with a thought experiment. Imagine this, it's the seventh century BC, right around 630 BC. The most notable events are wars, the founding, the founding of colonies and attempts to seize thrones all over the world. You are an Israelite woman, freshly free from the shackles of Egypt on your way to the biblical promised land. At this time, Moses is your leader. He issues God-breathed laws to keep social order. They are fair, just, holy, or so you think. Suppose you marry a man and he later decides he doesn't want you. So he makes up false accusations that you're not a virgin when you got married. Your parents are to bring you to the, are, you, are to bring your blood-stained wedding sheets that prove your virginity to the town leaders. The town leaders will then punish your husband. He will pay a fine of a hundred pieces of silver to your father and he cannot divorce you for as long as he lives. If, however, the charge is true and there is no proof of your virginity. You are to be stoned by the men of your city at the door of your father's house. Let that sink in. Upholding the status quo is a phenomenon that permeates society in an almost persistent fashion. In a country like Kenya, where religiosity is nearly as natural as breathing, sustaining religious values, especially without question, is second nature. A story like the one I just told is easily forgotten and more than likely unknown in most Christian spheres. Yet I have just read it directly from the Bible. It's easy to chalk off religious texts as having a higher message and ignore stories like this for being minor and inconsequential. I mean, it's barely a full chapter of the Bible. But let me ask you this. If you put yourselves in the shoes of that seventh century BC woman, if you feel her fear and her pain, if you internalize that her value was completely pinned on her virgin status, if you imagine your sister, daughter, mother, friend in that position, is it really forgettable? How many women died under that law, guilty or not guilty? A law that was delivered by a man anointed by God, a God who designed female anatomy, anatomy knowing full well the ineffective, ineffectiveness of virgin testing. Are we to believe that an omni-god had to succumb to a blatantly oppressive culture, had to create a law that was explicitly violent towards women? Are we supposed to ignore the differences in punishment? The woman has to die, but the man simply has to pay a fine and loses the right to a divorce, a right that wasn't even afforded to women in the first place. This isn't about God and his morality in, rel in religious texts, but rather about people of faith and the types of stories they have as reference points for their own morality. What images are depicted? What messages do they send? When I was doing my research, I found these interesting statistics. Oops, okay. You can see on my, on my screen, um, the statistics of doing. It says in Islam, women cannot lead prayers in mosques and in mixed gatherings. My sources are selected uh, for anybody who's curious. An Australian study found that higher religiosity was associated with stronger patriarchal beliefs. Sati, a Hindu practice, refers to self immolation, which is burning, by widows on funeral pyres of their husbands. It thrived for centuries, rooted in the belief of the futility of a woman's existence. And there are countless other examples from multiple religions. When you are observing the ways in which faith and patriarchy mirror each other, we must look at them as both of the hierarchies that they are. If in a patriarchy, men are at the top of the food chain, who is at the top in religious texts? Who delivers divine messages in holy stories? Who is granted the honor of these divine scriptures? In which ways is God gendered? 
if you've read most mainstream religious texts, I'm sure you're well aware that these people are overwhelmingly male. It's men who receive messages directly from a male God. And it is those same men who write those messages in books and scrolls to be, to be delivered to believers by even more men. In simple terms, religion seems to operate under its own patriarchy. Faith as a solution. Well, there's no doubt of the role that religion plays in the oppression and subjugation of women, that doesn't immediately make it ineffective as, as a solution. As we even saw in the cultures video, they illustrated a way that we could chat a faith-related path to the gender equality. I think as on the quote I put on my screen right now, religious and traditional leaders can be a part of the problem of gender injustice. Maintaining structures and perpetuating social norms can be and are increasingly seen as part of the solution. Their role in combating these unjust systems of oppression has never been more important. This demands that we work both within our respective faith structures and also reach, reach out to join forces with secular movements. Faith is a central part of many people, communities and even cultures. It governs how people live, the choices they make, both politically and personally, and how they interact with one another. Removing it from the equation is bound to alienate billions of people. And even when you look at culture as an organization, it has faith as a core part of its entire message. It's clear from the few examples that I've given that misogynistic ideologies from religious texts can and do lead into religious people's lives, consciously and subconsciously. If we are to reverse this damage, we must first do the hard work of unlearning and relearning. I'm sure we're all aware of education being used as a tool in the journey for change. This conversation is a clear example. It's a method of long-term change that is challenging, but necessary. I bring this up because in the journey of incorporating faith into gender equality, we must do the daunting task of approaching scriptures with a critical lens. And not just any critical lens, but a nuanced female-centered lens. The type that would not only first seek to understand the social climate of the errors that certain scriptures were written in, but also explicitly search for and call out clear biases against women that are woven into said scriptures. The type of lens that would notice a story like the one I just shared in the beginning, but not only notice, internalize, empathize, become angry for those women who existed in a society that could have such norms, norms that are being woven into sermons and congregations. Young people today are tomorrow's future, and if we want it to be bright, then you must raise us with a critical lens a lens that requires deep analysis and appreciation for context, and most of all, the bravery to critique, to not uphold the status quo, to realize that we are all products of our cultures and the divine messengers who wrote all of the religious scriptures so many of us devote our lives to are no different. Keep asking young people the types of questions that are being asked in this conversation today. Keep engaging us in stimulating conversation. Challenge us to dig deeper. All in all, I hope I have successfully shown you that there are patriarchal hierarchies in religious spaces and they contribute greatly to women's oppression. But beyond that, I hope I have shown you that dismantling these hierarchies and including women in the conversation may just be the first step, tangible change. Um, thank you, everybody. That was my presentation. Very short, but I hope my message was clear. Those are my contacts, my email on the screen for anybody who would like to interact with me outside of this conversation.
Thank you so much for the time. Zawadi, every time, first of all, thank you so much. Every time that I so like think about the fact that you are only 17, it blows my mind. So that was a wonderful presentation. And, um, you know, the, the question that I have for you, um, because you're talking about young people, you're talking about, and you're re you realize that there is fate definitely shapes our lives, whether it's conscious or subconscious. So these conversations, like the conversation we're having now, are they not happening where they should with young people? Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because I can say that even me who was able to do this presentation right now, I had to really dig deep before I was able to speak for this conversation. Because it's genuinely a topic that is not even thought about. It's something that you really need to be doing it consciously to figure out that there's not only a connection between faith and patriarchy, but to also realize we can use faith as we're liberating ourselves from the patriarchy itself. Okay. Well, I think we have work to do. So one of the things that I, um, so thank you again, Zawadi. Um, Brian, Zawadi talks about fates and conscious impact on people and young people and their views on gender equality. She made a very good case in terms of showing oh, there is a link, obviously. Um, well, not so obviously for some people. So now um, I know that you've been very involved. Uh, you've been from being in contact, being involved in the girl child and talking to you. I know that um, in terms of, of your family and the work that you've been doing yourself in the community and in your in your in your fit community, that you have a sense about what needs to be done. Um, can you please tell us um, what are some of the ways that you feel things can change? And some of the strategies and some of the things that not only you've used, but you also talked about your father being a bishop and what he's done. Tell us more. What can help the change that needs to happen? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for creating this time an opportunity to share with you. My name is Brian Lepish, a student in this university, and my mentor is Reverend Patrick Musembi. My presentation will be based on faith in relation to gender equality. I'll have to do an introduction and then do, and then do my presentation. I have some Bible verses and conclusion. Now, a small background about me. Born and raised in a Christian background, and my father is a bishop who helped me understand the role and the use of how can we how can we improve the lives of, of women in churches. Now, in my introduction, I want to have a small overview of this subject. How has how how can we use faith to to promote or to pioneer gender equality in churches? Faith in two things: one, in faith-based organization; two, in religious institutions like schools, universities. Like in Desta, the best thing we have we have a professor, who she's a lady, Professor Faith. So that also gives a room for girls in Desta to see it is workable. Now, number two is, how has faith helped in gender equality? If yes, to what extent? If no, how can we use faith to promote gender equality? Then, because I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm young, how has my generation, Generation Z, view on faith in relation to gender equality? This is a... Uh, this is an accountability question that I'd like to pose to myself and to my generation. To what extent, as young people, can we use faith to promote gender equality? Now, these are some of my findings. Reasons for gender inequality in faith-based on faith based on organ organization or places of worship. One, we have negative peer influence from our 
friends, especially for girls, because of uh, uh because of our uh, bringing up, we find it bad or it is unusual to find a girl leading. Therefore, they share this ideology that it is not good. Let the boys lead as you are here. Number two, discrimination from the male gender. This, especially this, I can, I can, I can wholeheartedly say, especially from me and my tradition, I'm a Maasai, and in our greetings, the worst part you do in our greetings, when we greet each other and we're about to leave, we say, go say hi to your cows and your children. So you see, we, we equate women to cattle. We, don't, we do not see the value of woman, a woman or women in this. So that makes the Maasai man feel superior over the women. And, that, and by doing so, this will make women not thrive or bring positive changes to the society. The last part is negative social beliefs that women not ought to lead. Women are meant to sell kids and to take care of homesteads. My question is, what happens if the husband dies? Who will be the head of the family? Kids or the mother? If the mother, then who is creating room for the woman to lead? If 24-7 our tradition perceive women are, are supposed to sell kids and to take care of homesteads. Now, after that, you want to look at how has the how can we change this situation? Now, changing this situation is first we have identified there's a problem. Number two, after identifying the problem, we have we have we have done a small research to see to what extent this problem has a ripple effect to the society. After we've done that, now let us see to what extent can we bring in the church on board to help us reduce these effects because these effects have two terms, has short-term and long-term effects. Now, one. As men in the room, can we sit down and say it's time we own our women and our girls for what they have done? This is categorically found in, Jer in Proverbs 31, 30, 31, the last verse of the book of Proverbs. It says, on her, on her for all that she has, that she has. And by doing so, she will bring back praises in the gates, in the city gates. Number two. Can we increase more roundtable discussions for our girls to understand their role, to understand who they are, also to build self-esteem? Number four, can we increase more educational opportunities for them to learn? Because I believe education, education brings a different view on how we on how on how we on how we think and how we shape our ideas. Number four, can we reduce the non-monetary activities that women do that women take part in faith-based organization one if we have a celebration women are ought to do decoration true or false they ought to do the stage they do everything but when it comes to funding things we only bring the male factor can you say by providing more 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 earning of more earning places for women to earn a living that will make women to be part of the decision making policy to be part of the fundings and by doing so, this will reduce the gap. Hence, giving women an opportunity to be the sole direction for such projects. Can you have a project that is led by women, funded by women, and men sit behind and see how, how, how women are able to stand up and change? The last one. Can you create more supporting opportunities for the young girls that have gone through gender-based violence? Or... In one way or the other, they are, they are pregnant because of poverty or because of some natural cases. For example, a girl is orphan and some men take advantage of such situation and tell her, for me to help you, come we sleep together in exchange of a living. By doing so, the girl gets, she's pregnant and then the man leaves. How can we do to such girls? Can we create an opportunity for them to come together and we, we empower them and we give them support system we provide for them places to sleep and to change because uh, one mistake is not the end of life people change and it's so it was that situation that a man took advantage of now after that i want to look at what should the church do to help the youth this is where the church comes handy because faith in relation to gender equality let's go back to uh, my topic of 
discussion. Faith in relation to gender equality. Now we've looked at from a holistic perspective. Now can we dig deep and we narrow it to the male, to the youth, sorry, to the youth, where how can church help youth to promote gender equality? One, by providing mentorship opportunities. Now, I'm here at Katasio, Dr. Reverend Msembi. Why? Because he's my mentor in school. He helps me when I'm when I face difficult situation, I go seek counsel. And by doing so, this helps me to come up with good, reasonable, Christian-based decisions that will not that will have a positive effect to me. Imagine if we had a hundred women in Nairobi to help girls. If one woman mentors a hundred women, let us have a uh, like. Uh, let us um, imagine a five-year ripple effect of that mentorship. Are we not seeing bathing a new generation of girls who, who are able to come up with good decision-making skills, are able to bring change to their houses, they're able to be the source of comfort to their mothers? Next, I want to look at some two Bible verses I found that they are key in my, in my today's presentation. One, let us look at Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, where God says, let us make man in our own image and likeness. I'm very keen. I want to draw my, my illustration in verse 27. And God created man in his own image and likeness. In the image of God created male and woman. In his own image, he created male and woman. Now, this is my question. Please get me right. The equality is not limited to spiritual standing before God, but the equality is limited. The equality should cut across all dominions of life. Why is only man that is it's only the male that takes dominion and the woman is not reflected in part and parcel of the decision making or in taking dominion on earth? Are we not seeing us as God's creature being unfair to the girl child, to the women, to the girls in the society? How can we change this? The second verse, Galatians 3, verse 28. It shows how, how the New Testament brings the equality to all, equality for all. But in return, as men, we choose to be, uh, we choose to take advantage of women and say, I'm a man, let me do this. Now, as I come to my conclusion, uh, those who have walked the long journey, uh, uh, do uh, those people who have been here? You know, I think as at the moment I want to finish my presentation, I always have an abbreviation for today is the three H. One is healing. Why are we healing? Healing is a self evaluation of the negative things a smell I've been doing to the girls and the women. Now, from our past, we need to create a sense of stability and, and understanding why we why we why we why we why we have been doing this to women. Number two is humility. Humility is freedom from arrogance. Arrogance in what sense? We as men, we need to remove the negative ego and toxic masculinity, masculinity for the from the society that a man is always the head and a woman cannot say anything before a man. The last is honor. Honor is mm, accrediting someone's value and respect. Can we honor women by giving them opportunities to serve and empowering them? By doing so, we'll be able to have a positive and a good sustainable society. It is the responsibility for every individual, especially the male, to pioneer women empowerment in our places. For this sound, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Brian. Um, I should add that Brian has been very involved and in actually using the Girl Child Long Walk, you know, ebook and chapters in his walk with girl and a woman and also pregnant woman, you know. And I should also sort of like give a bit of of uh, good news to the extent where last year, um, I believe in Tanzania, pregnant girls were usually not welcome back in schools. And Tanzania sort of like stopped that low. 
So, um, and it, it, it's amazing to think that there used to be such a law. And it's amazing to see, because I think when you talk about, Zawadi talk about this seventh century Israelite woman. Think about the fact that we are in the 21st century. And women, we women, women or girls are still blamed, only blamed for their the sins and held responsible and punish. Like Reverend Musambi said, we have a long way to go. And I think we need each and every one of us, and we need the young people, young people like Brian, young people like Zawadi. Um, at this stage, let me see, check on time. Um, are there any questions and comments? I see wonderful, I don't know Brian or Zawadi, if you see the chat, just great comments about your presentations and everything else. Thank you so much again for for making it and spending the time to doing it for us and being part of this. Questions and comments, anyone? Ah, oh. Joy, feel free to speak. Thank you. It's a great presentation. But I, um, I would like to start with, um, I think, Reverend, Reverend Pastor Patrick. Um, yes. Joy, your Saint connection is not good. Six of what boys think about gender equality. Um, I would like most time. Mm. Joy? Okay, can you hear me clearly now? Oh, yeah, it's better now. Okay. Can you hear me clearly now? Yeah, can you repeat your question? Okay, all right. I'm saying that what both I, I, I well, I think you do you want to put it in the chat because your signal is, is um, uh, is, yeah, no, can you put it in the chat? Because you're not coming through. Well, Joy tries to put, mm, did we lose her? Oh, oh, let's see. All right. Um, Shari? Thank you so much, Zawadi and Brian. I, um, I'd love to hear you each say something about where you see these conversations going on with your peers. Are you seeing these conversations going on with your peers? And if so, where and why, and how can we foster more of them? Um, Zawadi and Brian, Tari, thank you for the question, because I think Zawadi had talked about, because uh, we mentioned it, or basically these conversations were not happening. Is there any place at all where you see these conversations or these topics coming up? Um, well, I, I will say that even though I said that these conversations are not common, I will say that I've definitely had these conversations between my father and I, which I feel like is a very good place to begin. Because as you can see, me in this conversation, my father is the one who introduced the entire topic and then I'm here also talking about it. You can see that he fostered such thought process and critical thinking in me for me to be able to come here and speak about this. But not just only that, when you have a child who 
has been taught to think critically like this. I feel like it makes it easier for me to inspire such thoughts in other people my age, because wherever I go around me, I'm able to inspire such conversations around my peers because it was instilled in me from my home base. But even for those people who are not inspired on their home base, we can still find ways to include such conversations in places of worship, especially since we're talking about faith and gender equality. I know that in youth services, this is a great opportunity, especially if any youth brings up a story like the one I brought up in the beginning. I feel like it can be very good for religious leaders to take that as an opportunity to really open up this conversation and hear the thoughts of everybody in the room. Yes. Thank you, Zawadi. Um, I see a question about you know, how do we address from Gloria, how do we address the issue of expensive uh, bride prices in modern cultures in Africa? Because once your father is asking for 10 or more cows as your bride price, you will be seen as the man's property. This is very specific. Maybe I would, I would love to hear Zawadi talk about it because one of the conversations I had with her when she was young would be that uh, I'll ask for 100 cows. And that's actually how the conversation started. So <laughs> until she said for me, no cows, dad, no cows. So I, want to, I would love to hear what she would say. I. I would love to hear it too. I, when I was a teenager, I went in Morocco and uh, I uh, eh, there's a man who said that he would offer several camels for me. And I guess it was very flattering. I forget exactly the number. And I went back uh, home and I told my father, oh, this is what he said. And he said, that's quite an insult. You know, you're priceless. So <laughs> Zawadi, please. I can't say I have any like um, crazy opinion about bread prices because even when my father was telling me he'll ask for 100 cows, I knew he was saying it like as a joke. And I knew that's not what he actually meant. But in general, I would say that I can't say I'm very well versed on um, what to do with the bread prices other than that I'm 100% sure that it definitely makes it seem as if the bride is property and you're kind of being exchanged, you know, one property from one man to the other, which is exactly what we're fighting against. Yeah. Brian, would you like to add anything? And at this point, after Brian will need to um, wrap up unless someone has a question in the comment, another question or comment. Brian? For me? Yes. For me, uh, my take is I want to see bride price not as the value of the investment a father did towards his daughter, but an out of an appreciation for the investment you did to your daughter to this point that as a man, I'd love to, to invite her and we walk this journey together. So I'd like first, the girl needs to build value to a point the father views her as priceless, not a woman of value. Like first in Masai land, when you see a girl, we see cows, we see wealth. But for me, I want to build my family and a legacy that for me, even when I have daughters, I don't want to see them as a source of wealth. I want to see them as a source of hope to other families. And that's how I'll build that value. So let us stop this thing that you want to use our parents. And the, the investment the father did to the daughter as a man, I have to repay it before I take her. I will still build value, still have good connection with the in-laws, but I would humbly request our, our fathers to deconstruct that ideology of wealth in relation to bread price. That's all for today. Thank you very much. Um, I think that um, thank you, all of you, each and, and every one of you, I mean, the panelists and, and everyone. Um, and um, for people who have come, the participants, 
this is an important conversation. We will continue to have these courageous conversations because they need to be held um, everywhere, not just by us, but by other people. And Zawadi, you made my heart just melt when you talked about all these conversations were happening with your father. Oh, mm. my God. Oh, this is wonderful. This is what it should be. Um, Emily? Um, let's see. I was going to say something earlier, but, you know, I'll just enter in there. I have a feeling, Zawadi, that you have been a part of your dad's learning around gender equality as much as he has encouraged you to use your critical thinking. Because what I sense in you is that as a girl child, you presumed your own equality. You knew it inside yourself. You didn't need to find it in a Bible verse. You didn't need someone to point it out to you in the Bible. Um, you knew it because of something inside of you. And, and I just want to honor that. And Brian, thank you for being on this journey with us and everyone. It is a long walk. And I want to just underline that there have been women throughout the centuries doing this work of deconstructing and men too. It's really, really hard to change religious customs and sacred cows like bride price and dowry we have our own version in the u.s around marriage people get very patriarchal and conservative um so it's very hard to do this work um and so the work of like digging deep to find the seed of faith inside of you that is deeper than beliefs and traditions, uh, cultivating curiosity, which is what we're doing on the call, and a more conscious faith. So thank you, everyone, for joining us and to our amazing speakers and facilitator, Marie Rose. Thank you. Thank you. And please um, join our hub. Um, please join our event, uh, our future events. And thank you very much for being part of this. Actually, I have one quote to share. Okay. Um, when I was in Tanzania, this woman who was leading a group of women that had basically eradicated FGM in their community, it was a Maasai community, I asked her um, what motivates her, and she said, it's afternoon for us, but still morning for our daughters. And I just thought that says it all, that Zawadi, your generation, and Brian, you're still in the morning of your life, and we need to keep going and know that we are doing, every generation has to do our part, but we are behind you and just appreciate your voice in the world. Thank you.